<laughs> you don't have to be nervous. Just be. I'm the one that should be nervous. <laughs> I don't. I don't understand how you could possibly be nervous, Dr. Payne. <laughs> I don't either. Like you've done this before. <laughs> your entire life. Exactly. I know, still. I'm being interviewed by students. That's not usually what I do. So this is so exciting. And Sharp Ridge, my alma mater. Yay! Oh, we're going to get to that question. You'll love I that know. question. You're going to love that question. I know. We both were forced at Short Ridge. Yeah. I'm going to start the video and then we'll go from there. OK. Good morning, Shoreridge High School on this first Friday of October, October the 2nd. We are joined by Brianna Turner and Dr. Pat Payne. Bree, I'll let you take us off and go from there, and I'll send myself into the background. <laughs> okay, hi guys. My name's Brianna Turner, or as some of you may know me, Bree Turner. Um, today I will be talking about Dr. Patricia Payne, um, who has been an educator for more than 50 years in the IPS district. She first thought of the idea of teaching when she was a kid, seeing her uncle, her aunties, and her mother teaching. Her mother taught at School 41, which really made her want to be a teacher. But she wanted to become a teacher because of the school she went to, which for grade school, she went to an all-black school, and she went to an integrated short ridge around 65 years ago. She graduated. She she graduated high school and then went to Indiana University and studied to become a teacher. After she graduated college, she came back to Indianapolis to teach second grade, mostly to second grade. She came back to Indiana to teach second grade for mostly 25 years about black history that she wasn't taught while she was in school. She then went on for the next 25 years to work in IPS as an IEA member, but later on she became a director of the Christmas Attic Center, which became a safe space and opportunity for students of all races to know who they are and get to know uh, other ones. But she also has been to Africa three times. Everyone, I would love to welcome Dr. Patricia Payne. Good morning, good morning, Bree. So happy to be here at my alma mater, Short Ridge High School. Good morning, good morning. Okay, I have a few questions to ask you. Okay. Um, in one of the articles that I read, I found out that you begged your parents to go to Christmas Attics instead of integrated Short Ridge due to how they taught Black history and Short Ridge didn't. Do you regret going to Short Ridge even though they didn't teach you Black history? Well, no, I don't regret going to Short Ridge. And one of the main reasons I wanted to go to Attics was because that's where all my friends were going too. Um, but my mother, I can still hear my mother and father saying, you must go to the college preparatory school. And now when I think back on that, it's so weird because they both went to college and they both graduated from Christmas Attic. So Christmas Attic was also a college preparatory school. But no, I am um, there. I think that I am very, very happy that I went to Short Ridge, had the Short Ridge experience. I met, met many fine people. Now I did not learn black history at Short Ridge, but um, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> okay. Um, in your years of being in college, what made you want to become a teacher and to teach an all black younger grade level like second grade? Well, I always say that I came out of the womb knowing I was going to be a teacher. I think it, I was destined uh, to be a teacher. There's just some things you know that you should be. And I always wanted to be a teacher and plus everybody around me in my family uh, was a teacher because that was one of the only professions at that time that black people could go into. Of course, when we got into that profession, we could only teach those who looked like us, which really was a plus. Um, I, what was the last part of your question, Bree? Oh, second graders, you wanted to know uh, why I wanted to teach young minds. I wanted to be able 
to what I found about teaching second grade was that I had more parent participation. I just love teach. I still miss teaching uh, second grade. We had such a great rapport, our, my second graders. I would invite principal a uh, principal, well, principals too, <laughs> because I wanted everybody to come into our classroom. We did so many great things. Um, and I wanted second graders not only to learn black history, but to learn about who they were, where they came from, and to be proud of who they were. I would, um, when I taught, for instance, mathematics, I would use things from their environment to help them learn mathematics. I remember in my second grade room, we had a huge purple rug, a beautiful purple, purple rug, and we had these centers. I remember I had dice in my classroom because I would throw the dice and I'd say, add subtract because I wanted them to be learning, but it was a game to them also while they were learning. I, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, okay, that actually sounds really fun <laughs> for my next for my next question. Um, it was after you taught all black second graders, what made you want to not just teach them, but also teach white kids and older black kids who weren't being informed of their history? Because white children need to know the truth too. And that's what I was teaching them, teaching children the truth about who they were, where they come from. And we can't know our history without white people being in it. And white people can't know their history without us being in it. So I was about teaching children the truth. I wanna read a letter to you that I received from one of my white students um, not too long ago. He has become a teacher too. His name is Craig Howe. And um, let me just read this. I, I have framed this letter. It says, Mrs. Payne, or as I knew you, Miss Brown, when you taught at IPS School 61, my name is Craig Howe, and I was second grader in your class around 1975-76. I have been a teacher myself now for almost 25 years. And as I look back at why, I have to thank you. I was the first in my family to ever go to college because you built a confidence in me that I could succeed in school. I had been held back in first grade. From that time forward, all I ever wanted to do was to be a teacher because of the influence you had. In addition to giving me confidence to succeed, you made going to school fun. But most importantly, you taught me so many lifelong lessons. I now teach high school government and psychology. Even to this day, the lessons you taught me, some with a paddle and some with book reports, ha ha, still guide me. I teach in a predominantly white school that is slowly becoming more diverse, but I strive to get my students to understand social justice and injustice that I know comes from having had you as my teacher. I just want you to know I think of you often. I have attended many professional developments where the question is asked, who was the teacher that had the greatest impact on you? And my reply has always been you. I like to think your influence on me has transcended to my own kids. I have a son who will graduate from Boston College with a degree in theology in May that actively participates in social justice causes such as Black Lives Matter and LGBTQ marches and spent a summer studying social justice in South Africa. Funny that today's trigger for me thinking of you was me listening to a 1970s playlist on Spotify and Rock and Robin came on. And I remembered you playing that song in class. In fact, if memory serves me right, your daughter's name was Christy. Anyway, I just wanna thank you for being the great teacher you were to me a long time ago. This is what makes teaching. <laughs> That Bring was so students. sweet. Oh, oh my God, I know. So and sweet. not too long ago, he was in our racial equity training. He came to, and so I got to see him. And it, it must was, have been very nice it, to see him. Absolutely, yes. 
I would have gave him the tightest hug. I'd have been like, oh, I love your letters. <laughs> give him a virtual hug. <laughs> oh, yeah, because COVID. I forgot. <laughs> yeah. Okay. For my next question, this is about to get serious. Um, do you believe that some black teachers that once they see that they are teaching black students, some, some black teachers, yeah. that once they see that they are teaching black students, that they become colorist depending on the skin tone of the black student. By colors, I mean if they're teaching a dark skin, a light skin, a brown mm -hmm. skin. Mm -hmm. I think there may be a few because there's such a thing as internalized racism. And with internalized racism, that's where you even start thinking that there's something wrong with being black. And, and when that happens, anybody that's black, you look down on them, even though you're black yourself. That's crazy. Uh, he, and, and you see that going on a lot now when you see black on black killings going on in communities. And, and that has a lot to do with internalized racism. And it's, it's, it's really crazy. If I could just get to all these people who have these internalized, this internalized racism, they wouldn't have it anymore because they would know about the brilliance that blackness brings to the picture. That's what I try to teach teachers who have low expectations that, if you would allow the brilliance of these black students to come out, then you would understand. You would understand and your low expectations would disappear. But the thing is that students will bend to meet your low expectations, just like they will rise to meet your high expectations, you see. So that's, that's what we have to instill in people when I see that happening. Ooh. Yeah, I've, I've actually been a witness of um, internalized racism, so that's why I asked that question. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, in the recent awakening of Black Lives Matter, you said to the Indy Star, and I quote, we've been discussing this even before the horrible George Floyd incident. Why do you think we have to talk about racism, racial equality, and colorism in the school system regarding students and teachers? because it's alive, it's active. It's, we have to talk about it wherever human beings are. And the, the, the murder of George Floyd has illuminated, and not only the murder of George, George Floyd, the, the COVID-19 also, all of these events coming together at once um, has shown how um, the health disparities are illuminated in black and brown people. That shows how systemic racism works, you see. And that's why we need to understand what it's about. I'm so proud of our school district. I'm so proud of Sharp Ridge also. Our school district is actively training everyone in our district. In fact, it's going on right now as we speak in racial equity training. They have to go through two days of training from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. In fact, your principal is in the training as we speak over there. I just talked with him. Uh, and this training only concentrates on systemic racism because it's our belief that it is racism, that's the bookends that hold all the other isms firmly in place. So students, everybody has to understand how this racism works. It runs through education, it runs through health, it runs through any system, it runs through housing, it runs, not only does it run through everything, it shapes the outcomes of everything. So we have to understand this, and that's why it's so important that every staff person in IPS is going through this training because it also impacts instruction, how teachers instruct you. I'm trying to sharpen these answers, but I'm telling you, we are on such an important topic. Um, <clears throat> for my next question, I put, do you believe that black students have the tendency to be put behind white students due to the color of their skin? Which I believe you answered that earlier, but yeah. I'd like for you to elaborate a little bit more. Yeah. 
I think that may happen in in some instances of that again. That's why this training is so very important because we've got all this negativity about black people coming at us all the time through the media, through the textbooks. That's why students have to see themselves mirrored in textbooks. It's always coming at us. And so that means it lands in our belief systems. And that, <laughs> I'm looking for something. Oh, this is why it is so important that our teachers, they have to shift their knowledge, they have to shift their attitudes, their mindsets, and their belief systems. That's the only way that they can also shift how they instruct our students and please believe me this not only goes for white teachers it goes for all teachers you see we all went through the same kind of teacher training we went to iu or we went to some other higher learning institution but i don't think they yet do the kind of job that needs to be done in helping to prepare teachers to teach all students, not just white students, but all students. Okay. Um, for question number eight, I said, do you think that students should have, I mean, do you think schools should have police or correctional officers? Why or why not? I do not believe that schools should have correctional officers at all. That sends a message to students. That sends a very negative message to students that they are going to do something wrong, that they don't have sense enough to conduct themselves with honor. See, no, if it was up to me, I would remove all security from every single school. Students have enough sense to conduct themselves without police, police roaming around and looking like something's going to happen bad. No. I am absolutely against any kind of security in schools. Okay. Unless, of course, because if something mm -hmm. happens where we need security, we have the phone numbers to call security and they can come in those instances, but they don't need to be looking students in the face every day. Thank you. I'll have to ask that little part too. Um, <laughs> For question number nine, I put, have you ever thought about what would happen if you went to Christmas Attics instead of Shortridge? I think everything happens for a reason. So it, it was obviously meant for me to go to Shortridge. And I'm very glad that I went to Shortridge because now I'm able to do both. My office, isn't it something how life happens? My office, the IPS Racial Equity Office, which I direct, is at Christmas Addicts. So I've been at Christmas Addicts now over 30 years because when the IPS office of, and by the way, let me say how proud I am that I have been in IPS now for over 58 years. And my office has been at Attics for over 30 years. And not only that, I'm director of the IPS Christmas Attics Museum. If you all have not been, oh Lord, I don't know how you can go now with this COVID thing, but I think we even have virtual tours of the IPS Christmas Attics Museum. The IPS Christmas Attics Museum opened in 1998. It is only dealing with African and African-American history. When you go into this museum, the first thing you see is a pyramid going up to the ceiling because we want students to know that the history of black people did not start on a plantation in America. The history of black people started in ancient Africa. That is why I traveled to Africa four times, four times. Two of those times I went to Egypt just to learn about our history in Egypt, how we made those amazing pyramids, Khafra. Oh, oh, don't get me to start talking <laughs> on Egypt. I'm telling you, it is so amazing. And it was through the hands of black people 
black people that those pyramids were, were built. Khafra, Khufu, Menkara, those are the three pyramids of Giza. We looked at Horamaket, that's the, that's the African name for the Sphinx. And that nose is no longer on the Sphinx because Napoleon and his men blew it up. <laughs> I've got to come over there and talk to you all about my trips to Africa. I also went, spent six weeks in Nigeria. And when I went to Nigeria, my consciousness wasn't raised at that time. So uh, I was studying and thank God I was over there to study. We went to the museums and everything, but my consciousness was raised after I left that. That was all part of the plan that God has for you to do things. Then I went to South Africa. I was in South Africa as a part of the, I was head of the NEA Black Caucus, the National Education Association. So they sent us to South Africa to talk with the teachers there who were in apartheid and they had to slip over from Bots to Botswana to talk to us, which is an independent country. And so there's a whole story that goes that I need to come over there and talk with your world uh, changing class and we can do that virtually. OK, and then for my last and final question, I wanted to ask. Um, what do you think are the next steps for Short Ridge and IPS in living up to the commitment of racial equity? Listen. Dr. Martin Luther King talked about how the urgent, the urgency of now it is urgent. It is urgent that we do exactly what I see Sharp Ridge High School stu students doing now. You've got to read, you've got to study, you've got to share this information that you learned so you can learn the truth and teach it to others. We don't have a minute to waste. I was just reading yesterday an executive order that the President of the United States sent out where he is trying to stop the uh, people from learning this information, the truth of slavery, the truth about what the history of this country. People have to learn the truth to appreciate this country, see? So it is very urgent that racial equity and social justice, the learnings that you are doing right now at Sharp Ridge continues and it has to spread to every high school. It has to start spreading to <laughs> really this entire country so they will know the truth. I applaud Sharp Ridge High School. I am so proud to be in the Hall of Fame at Sharp Ridge High School. I love Sharp Ridge High School and I love what it has become because when I was at Sharp Ridge, I didn't learn black history. I certainly didn't learn about racial justice and uh, uh, social justice, racial equity like you're doing. So I applaud you and I want to continue to be connected with you. I have already invited Sharp Ridge to be a part of our equity summit that we hold in March. It'll be March the 24th. And I want Sharp Ridge to be the stars of the show so that we can put you on Front Street and others can copy what you are doing. So thank you very much. I have, this has just been wonderful. Are there any other questions? Because I can stay on this. Um, <laughs> yes, you have a lot of student questions. Um, uh, one said, how does she do all this work and not feel like the work is too much? It is um, divinely driven. It is divinely, it is spiritual. This is a spiritual mission for me. It's not just something I do. <laughs> I'm guided. The work that I do is guided, is divinely and spiritually guided. So uh, it, it, it is what I must do. It is what I enjoy doing from the moment I wake up 
And even this is something that you sometimes have sleepless nights over, but it's always because you're always thinking and, and wondering if what you're doing is right. And if you're meeting the needs that that the creator has put you on this earth to do. So I'm divinely guided and, and that is why, and I am 79 years old and still going strong because this Ain't is glowing. what I was put on this earth to do. Amen. Um, yes. Somebody else asks, okay, I'm gonna ask this because I really like this one. Um, it says, how can you educate others on their ignorance on the Black Lives Matter? Mm. Oh, that needs that needs so much help because people are very confused about what Black Lives Matter is all about. And when they tell you, well, all lives matter. Well, we know all lives matter, but we look at we got to start asking questions like why are black children always at the bottom when you look at the achievement gap? How is it you come out of the womb as genius says, but when you get in school, you're dumbed down. Something is very, very, very wrong there. So teachers have got to start asking. It's been normalized that we're at the bottom. And I'm not just talking about at the bottom in education. When we look at black families, black families are at the bottom in health. That's why with this COVID-19 crisis, you see the disparities and the disproportionalities going on with black and brown children and families. We're catching it faster than anyone else, but that is because the health system has not addressed our needs. And that's all because of racism, not just racism, but systemic racism that I told you runs through everything. So this is why this crisis has occurred with us. Okay, um, there one student said, how do you think biracial students by black and white um, are treated in school systems? And is it better or worse than how black students are treated in school systems? Mm, mm, mm. Biracial students I have found are treated worse than black students. Now, Blacks, because biracial students are black students, you know, they are black and they should be learning both histories. Uh, but what I have found is that black biracial students are treated worse by their fellow students than black students. It's not right, but that only means to biracial students, you got to know your history and culture and feel secure in your history and culture. You can't let these name calling people, that's the ignorance that they bring to the, to the picture. You know your history and culture and be proud of your history and culture. That is what is, that's why everybody has to understand the magnificent and the glory of where our history started and where it has brought us to at this point. We have so many amazing models to follow in our history, in black history. And that's why it's so important that we know who we are and where we come from. Um, some, somebody asked, how did you get through your school years feeling like the odd one out? Hmm. I didn't feel like the odd one out. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't really feel like the odd one out. I, it, does that, is that because that question refer because I went to Short Ridge or what is that? I, I'm not sure what it's referring so. to. It's because you went to integrated Short Ridge, but guys, the school was already integrated. So there were, it wasn't just her. She also had a few other black students who possibly yeah. also went to Short Ridge with her who experienced the same thing she did too. Yeah, yeah. Because when I went to Short Ridge, there wasn't one black teacher that, in fact, when I went to IU, there were no <laughs> black teachers. The only black teachers I had was when I was in grade school, see. So um, when I went to Short Ridge, there were other black students there. And there was a teacher there named Roy Aberson. 
he taught history. He he did try to teach us some black history. So I got to give Mr. Aberson some uh, credit. But what what usually happened in our schooling, all we were taught about was being slaves. Now they made sure that we knew we were slaves. Come on. I honor uh, those who were slaves, but there is so much more to our history than just being slaves, see, so much more. But the slaves, <coughs> you need to understand how brilliant the slaves were also, you know, because if it hadn't been for them, we wouldn't be sitting here now. Mm -hmm. After all that they went through, here we are, their descendants. You've got to honor your ancestors. You've got to know who your ancestors are. That's another thing that guides me in this work. The ancestors, they're all around me, guiding me, putting knowledge into me. You've got to understand that and know that it is for real. Um, okay, we have two more questions that we have to do. Um, I wanted to ask the question of when you were younger, what made you want to go to school every day and how did you feel? I, I bet I had wanted to go to school every day. <laughs> every, my mother was a teacher, my aunt was a teacher. In fact, I remember that my aunt would come by and pick me up every morning and take me to school 63 because she was a teacher out in Hallville. And then something happened where the school that we were going to was burned down. And then I started walking to school 36 over on 28th and Capitol Avenue. And school 36, only went to the sixth grade. So that's when I started going to George Washington Carver School 87. And school, I did, I grew up on uh, at 455 West 30th, right on the corner of 30th and Indianapolis Avenue. And so I just walked straight down Indianapolis Avenue to uh, George Washington Carver School 87. So, we better have one of school. <laughs> there was no option about going to school. That that was something that we better had wanted to do. And whether we wanted to do it or not, it was part of our makeup. We had to go to school. I mean, <laughs> it was just no option. Okay. And for the last question, there's so many questions. Dr. Payne, you just got to come in one day because there's so many questions and they're so good and I just really want you to answer them. But for our final one, I really want to say this because this has to do with our education. How can we incorporate African history into our curriculum while still navigating state standards and the APB slash IB? That's already supposed to be happening. You're, black history is supposed to be embedded within every subject. Now, let me tell you something. <laughs> wow, so much. In 1979, we started a movement because we were so upset that no black history was in the textbooks. And this was way back when I first came to IPS. And so we got together with a group of people and we started just raising hell about this. And so in 1979, the school board had a resolution that said black history shall be taught from kindergarten through 12th grade and infused into every subject. So that's us still on the books. Uh, and we even developed curriculum guides for that. So black, this black, and now I want every student is who's listening to me to go you have your own uh pledge racial equity pledge but i want you to go to the ips website and i want you to read the black lives matter pledge that this school district has passed have you already read that yeah, I read it. It was really okay, good. Okay, I, I want all students to read that. This is under the leadership 
of our wonderful superintendent, Alicia Johnson. I'm telling you, she is all up in this movement. Um, and you should also read the IPS Racial Equity Policy 1619. You see, I'm wearing my 1619 bid. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. You need to understand the relevance of 1619. And that's what the president of these United States is trying to squash. So I, that's why I said it's the urgency of now that we're doing this. Read those two documents that the IPS school board passed unanimously. You must read that and know that. And uh, as well as your own racial equity pledge. And what we have to do is lift those words off the page and put them into action. Okay, that concludes our our interview. Oh, our no. form. I know, I know. We're gonna have to get each other's email and stuff because I want you to come back to Shortridge. I would um, love to. If you could possibly come to Black Student Union, that yes. would really help us also. Um, Shortridge, Packer put the uh, pledge in your emails, so go check your emails like Good. now. Yeah. Right. Great. Also, you. you better read it. Don't just skim through it like I know half of you guys do. Read it. Actually read it and, and live it. Let it sink yeah, in because it. some of y'all really need it to sink in. Okay. Okay. Also, thank you, <laughs> Dr. Patricia uh, Payne. I love you, you so much. I, I love your love energy. You. I love everything. I love it. Ah. I'll be back. Be sure be to back. be back. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Going back to racial equity training now. <laughs>